Christopher Lockhead, and I'm the co-author of uh, several books, including Play Bigger and most recently, The 22 Laws of Category Design. And I, like a lot of entrepreneurs, um, uh, became an entrepreneur as a way out of a life of struggle, not as a way up in the world. And um, one of the greatest pieces of advice I ever got was follow your different because different wins and better doesn't. Follow your different. Christopher, when, who, who gave you that advice? When did you hear that? Well, it was very, very early on in my career. And uh, I was a dear mentor uh, who became a friend of mine named Tom Dagenet. And, and what he meant by it at the time was, you know, I started my career very early at 18. And um, I had no experience, no money, no relationships. Um, and so one of the mistakes I made, Phil, was I, I tried to pretend to be an entrepreneur or to act like an executive. And, um, you know, it worked. But when we're acting, we're acting. And I felt embarrassed. I felt maybe even a little ashamed that I didn't have all these credentials and degrees. I got, I got thrown out of school. I don't have a GED. I found out, I got thrown out at 18, started a company, and I found out at 21 that I have four or five uh, learning differences, dyslexia, dyscalculia, ADHD, executive function, blah, blah. I put them all together and I call it dysfuclea. <laughs> and uh, of course, what they don't tell you in school is those things are superpowers. And the only reason they're viewed negatively is because neurotypical people design the education system and neurotypical people design the hiring uh, models that companies use. When in point of fact, people who are neurodifferent often are the ones with the greatest superpowers. Many of the greatest people that we admire the most were neurodifferent, not neurotypical. And so Tom was sort of letting me as a very young man, he was a senior partner at Deloitte when I met him on the technology side. And as a very young man, he was letting me know, look, yeah, those are differences. Some people might consider them deficits. They're not. It was his way of telling me he thought, A, I was a super high potential young guy, and B, fuck them and go for it. Wow. So so how at 18, 21, how do you even get connected to somebody like that? I read your article that says networking is bullshit, right? Basically. And I'm looking at that. I'm like, well, how, how do you meet people if you're a nobody and nobody knows you? I mean, did you like, were you what, like, were you in a big city? I mean, I'm in like right now I'm in a city of 65,000 people. I know like three people I knew, you know, I grew up in a town in 986, 996. If there were people there, none of them ever helped me. So I had to network. I didn't have any other path. So what, Talk to me about that. Like, how did that happen? Well, I think, and the principles are still the same today. Uh, the simple answer is get out in the world and make a difference. And in my case, what that meant was me and one of my uh, buddies started a company. His name was Jack. And uh, we had a, uh, a computer, a phone. And what at the time, this, this giant thing that was about this thick called the Yellow Pages. Ooh. And the yellow pages were something the government gave you that could be interpreted as a giant list of cold leads. <laughs> sure. And so I, as an 18 year old, got on the phone and started telemarketing to try and sell clients. And eventually I did. And then we got some clients. And then we did what all small e entrepreneurs know is the number one growth engine. It's interesting, you know, I've been in business now 37 years. I've been the chief marketing officer of three publicly traded Silicon Valley companies. And I've helped over 50 startups. And, Phil, I've never seen one, not fucking one, marketing plan that mentions word of mouth, never mind is centered on it. And yet WAM is, was, and always will be the greatest form of marketing. So what we did was we cold called. We got some clients, we served the shit out of those clients, tried to deliver massive value, earn their trust as a result of delivering value. And then guess what? They introduced us to people. And so by starting with a cold start, 
by trying to be different in a very crowded market at the time and by delivering on solving a big problem that mattered for customers, we got the most coveted thing in business, which is a reputation via word of mouth. And we just kept growing from there. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. So starting up, yep. Deliver. I, I get all that, right? Delivering all that. I was stuck in corporate. Uh, and I say stuck. I, I was happy to be there. I didn't realize that I was, you know, that I that I was kind of stuck, right? I, but I, so I found other ways to network. But I love that advice, right? Do kick ass work. That's always kind of get out in zero. the world. Like th this is the thing I'm reacting to. Okay, there's a lot of people okay. out there who tell young people today, oh, send somebody a LinkedIn invitation and say, "Hi, my name is Sally, and I'm here to network with you." Right? Well, those get deleted. I don't have time to quote quote unquote network with you. However. If you're somebody who's broadly in my category or field of interest and you're posting thoughtful content, you're interacting digitally in a digital space that I'm in, um, you begin to develop a reputation as somebody who's participating, engaging, collaborating, contributing, and so forth. And then I see what you're doing in the digital world, in the digital community or communities that I'm in, that I value, all of a sudden you become a little more known to me. And so um, then there might be an opening for a discussion about something of substance as opposed to how I'd like to network with you. <laughs> All right. I agree with you. We're on the same page <laughs> then. We're on the same page. And I do, I, and to your point about being different, I do think that's very different. I re, I get hit with tons of crappy messages on LinkedIn that totally do not stand out, that totally are not different, that are the same, that are cookie cuttered, that really clearly have no idea who I am. I got one, actually, um, this guy must use some email generation system, figured out where I am. Now, mind you, I know this guy. I've met him in person. We've connected other ways. And yet still, he scrapes my LinkedIn information and sends me the same shitty message he sends everybody else. I'm like, that's not going to freaking work. Like that, that I'm yeah. not, now I'm really not going to buy your stuff. The other one that is, uh, I would say even worse is what we around here call obvious lie marketing. An entire generation has been taught this with direct marketing. They send you an email and they say, Hey, Phil, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. I really love the episode with fill in the blank, which is almost always the last episode. And uh, I have a guest that, that I think you'd love, or I'd make a really great guest on your podcast. And they go into their pitch. Now, look, people aren't fucking stupid. They know that is a lie. It's an obvious lie. Um, and so when you start off a quote unquote relationship with me with an obvious lie, go fuck yourself. And so there's all these stupid uh, manipulation techniques that are ridiculous that people use when they're cold calling or cold, e cold emailing, as opposed to doing what they should do, which is uh, for our book, Snow, Le Snow Leopard, we did the largest uh, category science research project ever done on nonfiction books. And what we wanted to do, we licensed the data from Nielsen, and they told us that, so that's why I say that. And we licensed it under strict uh, conditions because there's things we can say and can't say. But what we wanted to do, Phil, amongst many things, but we wanted to study which business books tipped at scale and which didn't. A, because we're business book writers. B, we wanted to share it with other writers who are particularly trying to create their own categories. And most importantly, business books are a proxy for ideas. So we wanted to understand why some ideas tip and why others don't. When on the surface, they maybe look like equally great ideas. Well, there's many insights we gained from the data, but here's, here's the big one. So of the nonfiction book categories, there's, uh, at, at the highest level, there's eight or 10 other categories. What do you think would be the number one category of nonfiction book sales in America? I don't know, cookbook? So how-to books are up there, but the number one category, personal growth, personal development. 
oh, sure, of course, right? We all want to get better and we all want to help ourselves. The number two category, personal finance. However, the entire fucking marketing world has been duped into thinking, oh, it's all about your brand. It's about your Tell your brand story. Oh, I know. You need a personal brand. Asinine. Brands are about us. Well, guess where um, uh, autobiographies and biographies fall? Like eight or nine? Yeah. Categories are about customers, their problems, their wants, their needs, their opportunities. Yet everybody in the marketing world markets their brand. Let me tell you how awesome I am. It's the Gary VD socially transmitted disease. As opposed to, let's talk about a problem that might matter to you. And that's the difference between a marketer who's fighting for existing market share by screaming the value of their product company and or brand and a category designer who says, let me help frame name and claim a problem for you that you might have that if you understood, you might be interested in, and I'm going to use these words on purpose, Phil, a different solution. A different solution. Because ultimately what we've tried doesn't work or we wouldn't be looking for more, right? We wouldn't be looking for a different answer. Well, yes, and here's why it doesn't work. When most people say marketing, what they actually mean is we are going to launch a new product, brand, comp or company, and or company service into an existing market where there's existing demand. And, of course, there's existing competition. And what we're going to do in that market is we're going to explain to everybody why our product, service, company, brand is better. Faster, cheaper, less expensive, but better. And we're going to use the as-is products in the current category as a comparison. And we're even going to invite comparison so, for example, we were talking before we went on about the SaaS space, about the software space. Well, guess what? If a company in the SaaS space does well in a Gartner quadrant or a fourth wave, they put it on their fucking homepage. Idiot marketers invite comparison. Legendary category designers force a choice. They want to break and take new ground. They don't want to fight over old things. They want to create abundance in new things. And so most marketers, without realizing it, are playing in what's called the better trap. And here's the aha. In tech category after tech ca category after tech category, one company earns 76% of the total value created. We studied every tech uh, startup from 20, uh, 2000 to 2015, and then we recently redid the research, and the numbers hold. And so here's the aha. When a new category emerges, it begins to attract a ton of attention because customers are going, hmm, what's that about? Huh, that seems unusual. That seems interesting. I haven't heard that before. Ooh, I haven't quite thought about that before. Ooh, are other people getting interested in that? Maybe I should be interested in that. This is exactly what we've experienced, for example, over the last handful of months about generative AI. Right? So one of the reasons that OpenAI became the fastest growing software product in history, is it an amazing technology and product? Absolutely. It's a legitimate, massive forward breakthrough. However, AI had a lot of negative connotations. AI had a lot of failed promises prior to OpenAI's launch of their product, ChatGPT. So what did they do? I said, this is not AI. This is a new category of AI called generative AI. Oh, no, we're not using data. We're creating large language models. What's that about? How's, how's uh, an LLM uh, different from a database or a data lake? Oh, now we're having a conversation. 
And all of a sudden, open API, open AI, excuse me, goes from being one of a billion generic AI companies to being the category queen of generative AI. And they literally move the world from an old way of thinking to a radical new way of thinking. And they do that by doing what we call in category design, prosecuting the magic triangle. They get product, company, and category right. And if they hadn't done the category design, I'm not sure we're talking about them today. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, AI was robots, the Jetsons, uh, you know, nothing anybody wanted anything to do with. And now nobody can stop talking about open AI and chat GPT and now Charlie and insert uh, Jasper or whatever in there. So interesting. So, so how do we come up with that new category, Christopher? I mean, that, that's gotta be, that's, that's gotta be the question everybody's going to ask here. Cause that's what I want to know. Yes. So here's the first thing. Category design requires a radical amount of unlearning. And unlearning is way harder for most of us, myself included, than learning. So what's the number one thing we've been taught in business? And in school, too, for that matter. Compete. We compete in school and sports, and we compete for grades. We compete on the LSAT and the MCAT and the FLAPCAT and the uh, 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 uh. And to see who can get into the super ding dong school. And if you don't, then you get to go to a piece of shit school. And, and so we've been taught to compete. Um, there's about a hundred thousand marketing books on Amazon. There's about 30,000 business strategy books on Amazon. And if you go and read a bunch of them, look, we haven't read all of them, of course, but me and my collaborators have read, as I'm sure you have, and many listeners have a lot of the Bibles. So if you look at um, um, Good to Great, or you look at um, um, Innovator's Dilemma, these books are all about explaining how to compete with better. Well, here's the thing. That's not what Henry Ford did. That's not what Sarah Blakely did. That's not what Bob Marley did. That's not what Sam Altman did. All of those folks did something different. They introduced the world to a new way to think about a problem slash opportunity and therefore a solution. And often a problem that people hadn't thought about. I'll give you one of my favorite examples. This, If I could own one product right now, this is the product slash company I'd want to own. Purell. So Purell was created by a company called Gojo Industries. And Gojo Industries has been in business for over 100 years. And the name Gojo is a portmanteau of the two founders. I think it was Gloria and I'm, I'm blanking on both husband and wife. And it started because the wife worked in a factory. And she thought that bar soap was sh and sharing bar soap was fucking disgusting. It was dirty. It was full of man hair. And she's like, like all great legendary entrepreneurs, to quote the big Lebowski, this aggression will not stand, man. There's got to be a different way. And they created a new category called liquid soap. And if you go into most restaurants, hotels, uh, and the like today, uh, office towers, and you go take a pee, and like a good person, you wash your hands afterwards and you squeeze the squeezy, um, you will probably see a Gojo Industries logo. Now, here's the difference between Gojo and the vast majority of marketers, entrepreneurs, and salespeople. They're focused on the problem. They're focused on thinking about the problem. They're focused on marketing the problem. Most of us want to talk about our solution. Let me tell you all about my product. Oh, it slices and it dices and it does the laundry. And I don't look at it. Isn't it cute? Isn't it big? Isn't it small? Isn't it, isn't it sleek? Isn't it fat? Isn't it, you know, whatever, right? If you ask any entrepreneur, myself included, hey, tell me all about your product. Fucking sit down and have a beer because we're going to be going for a while, right? However, the Gojo folks are obsessed with the problem. So over time, they kept thinking about this problem. 
And they asked a very powerful question as they thought about the problem. And the problem they asked, they probably, the question they asked that nobody had ever asked before, which is, which was, how do you wash your hands in the absence of soap and water? And then they realized, wait a minute, you're not washing your hands. That's the current category. Wash, and our choices are bar soap and uh, liquid soap. What if there's no wash with water? What if we, and this is something we teach in category design, reject the premise. And what reject the premise means is I, I'm, I'm going to ignore the way it is now. And I'm going to unshackle my mind to think in unencumbered ways about what could be true. So in a perfect world, how would you not wash your hands, but get your hands clean as effectively as possible? Ah, new category, hand sanitizer, Purell. This is a privately held company that, if I'm not mistaken, is currently being run by the granddaughter of the founders. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So we have to, yeah, get get out of our head where we are now and think of what might be. I mean, the, you, you wrote in a recent newsletter about how that's what Airbnb did, right? And maybe that's kind of the co-working slash we work model, though. We won't go down that rabbit hole with how crappy their run as they're now about to be bankrupt but yeah but their business failure is actually not a category failure the category idea is genius for we work that's why they made it so long in spite of the fact that they were run by a guy who's a wackadoodle and um you know he did not build a solid company but the idea for the category is right on the money which is in a world where we all have way more agency about where we work and when we work and how we work, in a world where uh, many of us are traveling around, I want to be able to have a just-in-time office for myself and or my small to mid-sized team. So WeWork makes a lot of sense. Why would I sign a lease? WeWork is the Airbnb, if you will, of office space. It's genius. Now, the fact that they have a wackadoo, some people say criminal founder, and they fuck their business up and all that, that's on the, so in, in, in category design, we call it prosecute the magic triangle, product design, company design, and category design. That's a great example of legendary category design, legendary product design, shit-ass company design. <laughs> That's funny and very true. So, so with that, I, that that plays into the next thing that I'd like to talk about, and that is the whole magic handshake test. I think the handshake test is, is something that people often overlook, and I, I you know, I, I get asked all the time about, okay, so what's the contract look like, and what's all that, and it's like, mm, I think we're missing the point here. So, how do you define the handshake test, Christopher? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, so I, for a long time, was one of the biggest pains in the ass in Silicon Valley to negotiate with. I mean, really. And I would negotiate hard and I would negotiate every fucking issue uh, like it was the most important issue. Uh, not just the money side, although I was a bastard about that, but a whole bunch of other things as well. And I learned a couple things along the way. I don't do any of that anymore. And uh, anybody who did business with me would be shocked to hear that because being on the other end of the negotiation with me was generally not fun. Yeah, but here's what I learned. A, when you're, when you're a pain in the ass on the front end with a company and people that you really truly want to do business with, they view you as a pain in the ass. And they're right. Point A. Uh, point B, anybody who wants to fuck you is going to fuck you, regardless of what the contract says, period. And you're going to, if, if you take it all the way, you're going to be in a legal battle with them, period. And contracts are, and I know it's going to sound crazy to a lot of people, but contracts are very fungible things, and they're things that are subject to a lot of interpretation. So 
the aha here is a if you're an asshole when you're negotiating deals you're an asshole b a shitty person is going to fuck you over no matter what the contract says so the learning and in my case expensive learning is do business with people that you can do business with on a handshake and i'll tell you a quick story about this uh, years ago, I was on the board of a, a, a high growth, super potential, super high potential company. Uh, the company started fucking up. And in my opinion, the CEO was making big mistake after big mistake. Well, after he made one particular big mistake that I was actually involved with helping him make and recommended the mistake. So I was guilty too. I realized in this case, it was hiring a person. I realized two weeks after we hired this person that she was one of the worst hires we possibly could have made. We need to fire her right the fuck away. And he didn't want to do that because he was afraid it was going to make him look bad to the board and to the company. And I said, look, we'll just call the CEO, Jimmy. Look, Jimmy, um, blame me. We got to fire Sally. Blame it all on me. Fire me. I'll be the sacrificial lamb. I, I'd rather uh, me go down than the company go down. Anyway, he didn't do any of that. And the company ultimately went down but in between then and the and my suggestion he and i got into a big fight and he proceeded to fire me which he's welcome to do when when an advisor board member disagrees with you and you can't resolve go ahead now here's the part that he also did he tried to fuck me out of all my stock so i got one of the most powerful employment lawyers in silicon valley and i was ready to go and fucking smash him. And the company was, at the time was getting ready for an IPO. And I was like, great. I know how to fight with unconventional weapons, you piece of shit. You'll have to explain to everybody on your IPO roadshow why one of your most recent board members left and is now suing you for wrongful termination in every single one of your investment calls. So this is all playing out. It's about to, it's about to go. We're at, we're at the end. I'm about to launch the lawyer. Here we go. Before I do so, I call a guy that I know on the board. And this guy is one of the most honorable people in the history of Silicon Valley. And he's with one of the most honorable firms, venture firms as a venture capitalist in all of Silicon Valley. And I said to him, we'll just call him Sammy. Hey, Sammy, I'm really sorry to bother you about this, but me and Jimmy have been going at it for about three months. I don't see any way around it. He wants to fuck me on my stock. And so I'm going to fucking launch a giant cannon into the side of this fucking company uh, on the eve of the IPO because I have no choice. He says, okay. Then he asked me some specifics. He says, what about this? And what about that? And what happened here? And what happened there? Okay, great. And he goes, you're right. Jimmy's wrong. Can you give me tw uh, 24 hours? I said, sure. You can take as much time as you want. A few hours later, I got a text from the VC. He said, we're done. You have all your stock. And here's what I know. That VC spent zero time looking at any of the agreements, the stock option agreements, the company stock policy. The, he didn't do any of that stuff. Why? Because this person became this person because he knows the difference between right and wrong. And he knows that his word is his bond. And so that's the learning. And so the aha around the, sh the handshake test for me is, yes, we're going to, if you and I were to do a deal together, I was going to invest in your company or you were going to, we were going to write a book together or whatever the thing was. Of course, we would memorialize it with some kind of an agreement. Adults in business generally do that. Okay. And it's required. And it's, it, in some ways, it's really good because we can set expectations and, and it's formalizing it. And so there's a lot of good things. I don't want to just shit on contracts. When they're, particularly when they're done powerfully and when they're done collaboratively. And if you think we, quote unquote, really need a contract, and I think we really need a contract, we shouldn't be doing this. And here's the interesting thing. As Martin Luther King Jr. told us, the arc of history tends to bend towards justice. And so if we're gen generally a good person, 
and we do good things and our word is our bond and we don't fuck with that and we develop a reputation as being a fair person who does what they say they're going to do and is an honorable person and is a person that's willing to be flexible and listen and is a person who takes a long-term view of their career. Listen, I've been in the tech industry for 37 years in the tech startup ecosystem. There's no way I'd still be in it if I didn't have the thing that everybody in business wants but doesn't understand. An entire generation has been taught by Gary VD and the other hustle porn stars to be the personal brand. Well, that's a contrived set of bullshit that we want to spew into the world. When in point of fact, what we really want is we want to earn a reputation. And if you earn a reputation, you will have a lifelong career driven by word of mouth. And if you don't, you'll have to spew out stupid bullshit with your personal brand to try to hoodwink people into doing business with you. And that's the difference. And so in my life today, and I realize, look, this is not always possible. I'm in a somewhat uh, unique situation. But in my life today, Phil, there is absolutely nobody that I do business with that I don't do business with on a handshake. And yes, ultimately it gets memorialized in a contract. But in some cases, you know, a company that I've been helping now for a couple of years, um, we were we were two thirds or no, we were about halfway into the project because we had to move very quickly before anything was memorialized in an agreement. And I did it anyway, because I knew the reputation of the CEO and we were connected via somebody that we both respect and have known for a very long time who vouched for us to each other. And so here we were halfway through this giant initiative. We'd agreed verbally, but you know, the lawyers and the blah, 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 blah. And theoretically, this CEO could have said, oh, hey, thanks, Chris. You gave me a ton of great shit. Go fuck yourself. We're not, we're not, we're not doing the deal. Um, but I knew the likelihood of that happening was infinitesimal because of who was involved. And that's the handshake test. Awesome. Awesome. Well, lots of great stuff that you shared today, Chris. Thanks so much, man. Where if people want to connect with you, if they want to get to know you, I saw. Oh, I'm not here very much on your LinkedIn. So where do you want people to go? Where can they get to know you more? Go to lockhead.com and all my shit hangs off there and all the ways in which we can connect are there. L-O-C-H-H-E-A-D.com. Cool. Awesome. So get to know Chris for Lockhead. Chris, I'm so glad that I got to spend some time with you today, man. You're a fascinating guy. I hope we can do this again. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks, Phil. I really appreciate it.